Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N I. Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here, the GMAT official guide 2021. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. Today, we will solve some multiple choice problems that you will find on page number 82. Come to it, make sure the book is in front of you. Page number 82, the very first problem is number 130. After having watched this video, if you find it helpful and if you like to, if you decide that you would like me to help you prepare for the exam, that you would like to hire me as your tutor, you can reach me at Kashwani Prep, that's P R E P, at iCloud.com. Let's begin. Number 130. It says that a firm has 65% full-time employees. We are further told that 5,100, 5,100, it has 5,100 more full-time employees than part-time. The question simply is, what's the total? Let's find out, shall we? It's a pretty straightforward thing here. So the total number of employees that the firm has, has to be obviously equal people who are full-time and people who are part-time. And we are told that it has 5,100 more full-time people than part-time. So the number of full-time is 5,100 plus the number of part-time. Because it has 51 more full-time than part-time. So whatever the part-time is, if you add 5,100, you get full-time. And that, that is part-time right part here. So it's 2P, 2P plus 5,100 equals total. That's our one equation. That comes from here. That came from here. The second equation we have is on the top, which tells us that the number of total employees that he has is split into 65% full-time and 35% part-time. Which means part-time, which I'm using letter P to represent part-time, which means number of people that are part-time simply represents 35% of T. So we can replace that here. Part-time is simply 35% of T, so it's 0 0.35, 35% of total. 5100. So that gives us 0 0.7 T. Bring it here, we end up with 0 0.3 T equals 5100. And therefore, T equals 5100 divided by 0.3 and let's pick it up on the top here 5100 5100 divided by 0.3 let's multiply top and bottom by 10 so can then we can get rid of this decimal and that will give us 51,000 which I'm going to write which I'm going to write it like that over 3 and let's divide top and bottom by 3 and we know 51 is divisible by 3 because 5 plus 1 is 6 and the sum of the digits is divisible by 3. Therefore, 51 is divisible by 3. Let's divide by 3. 5 has 1, 3. After we take away 3 from the 5, we have a remainder of 2. 2 goes and joins the 1 and becomes the 21. And 21 has 70. There you go, 17,000. The total number of employees that the company has, the total number of employees that the firm has is 71,000. Or rather, 17,000. Number 2. 100 and, or rather 30, 131, I'm going to say, 131. 131 says that C represents the cost of removing, cost of removing, pollutants. We are cleaning our pool, our swimming pool, and the cost of removing pollutant in a swimming pool is represented by C. P in the equation is going to represent percent of pollutant. And C we are told is equal to one hundred thousand P over 100 minus P. 
and the question simply is how much more how much more would it cost to remove 90% pollutant versus just 80%. So apparently the way it's presented to us is that the cost of removing pollutant from our pool depends on how clean you want it to be. The higher the percentage, the more the cost. And this is the equation. And the question simply is, how much more will it cost if I tell the guys who came to clean my pool, if I tell them that I want to have 90% of the pollutant removed from it, as opposed to if I just tell them, just remove 80% of the pollutant. That's what it is. Let's do it here. P represents the percentage. Very straightforward. We put 90 first in here, calculate the cost. Then we put the 80 for P, calculate the cost, and sub subtract the one from the other. That's all. How much more will it cost? So the cost of removing 90% of the pollutant, C subscript 90, would simply be 100,000 times 90 over 100 minus 90. 100 minus 90. 100 minus 90. P represents 90. 100 minus 90 is just 10. Let's just write it as 10. And then 10 goes away here and just 9 times 100,000. So it's 900,000. I must have a one hell of a pool. Let's find out the cost of uh, removing just 80%. Now, don't be lazy, don't be hasty, don't be arrogant, don't just say that the cost of removing 90% is 900,000, the cost of removing 80% should be 800,000. Let's do it out. It is given there for a reason. Let's do it out. Let's not be hasty. So again, 100,000 times 80, and what's going to happen in the bottom is that this goes from 90 to 80, but it does not become 800,000 because the bottom, instead of 10, will now become 20 because it's 100, because it is 100 minus 80. 100 minus 80 is going to give us 20. It is no longer, the denominator is no longer 10, it is 20, which is why it's always a good idea not to be hasty. Don't, don't, jump, to, don't, don't, don't jump to conclusion. Zero goes away and divide by two top and bottom and it becomes four times 100,000 and it is 400,000. And the question was, how much how much more does it cost? The answer is about half a million dollars more. Well, not about not about half a million. Half a million dollars is the answer. It's going to cost you half a million dollars more to have that additional 10% of the pollutant removed. If that is what your concern is. Number 132. One hundred thirty-two tells us that x squared minus y squared minus xy equals six, and the question is, which could which could be y in terms of x? And here are the here are the choices. Could y be, could y equal to 1 over 2x? Or could, or could y be negative 2 over x? Or could it be, could y be 3 over x? Our job is to identify all the possibilities and then of course pick the answer based on the proper combination. Let's find out, shall we? So we're looking for y in terms of x. So what we need to do here, what we need to do, I hope you're able to see right away, that this is a quadratic equation. So what we need to do is solve this quadratic equation. Let's do that. Here's the equation here, x squared minus y squared minus xy equals 6. First thing we're going to do, instead of, instead of rewriting x times y, x times y everywhere, let's write it in simpler form. Let let a equal x times y. We're going to define a new variable. So the equation becomes a squared minus a equals 6. 
which in turn becomes a squared minus a minus 6 equals to 0. So now we are looking for two numbers whose product happens to be negative 6 and whose sum happens to be negative 1, which is very easy. The two numbers that we are looking for, the product has to be negative. We want the sum to be negative 1, which means the negative has to go with the bigger absolute number. Negative 3 and a positive 2 will do just job nicely. Negative 2 plus a positive 2 will give us negative 1 and negative 3 negative 3 times positive 2 will give us negative 6. I don't know why, I'm, I have no idea why I'm explaining so much. So let's factorize it. So it's going to break into a squared minus 3a plus 2a minus 6 equals to 0. And from these two terms we have a as a common factor. a minus 3 is what we get here. And from these two terms we have 2 as a common factor and it becomes a minus 3. And now we look at this part and we look at that part and we have a minus 3 as a common factor and what we are left here is a plus 2 equals 0. We're almost done. That's it. That's the work we needed to do. Now we can pick up from the top. So there are two possibilities. There are two possibilities. One is that since, since the product of these two quantities is 0, one possibility is that a minus 3 equals to 0 or a plus 2 equals to 0 or they both equal to 0. So if a minus 3 is equal to 0 or a plus 2 is equal to 0. If a minus 3 is equal to 0 that means a equals to 3. But remember uh, a is simply x times y. a was simply x times y. And since we are looking for y, since we are, since we are interested in the value of y in terms of x, let's solve this for y. And in that case y would equal 3 minus x. There you go. That is the first possibility right here. Which means the correct answer, which means the correct answer, whatever it is, must contain 3 in it. Must contain 3 in it. Let's continue. And the second one, it says a equals negative 2. And a is simply x times y equals negative 2. Again, solve. if we solve for y, we get y equals 2 negative 2 over x. Ah, and negative 2 over x is this one right here. So that was statement 2 and this was statement 3 which means the correct answer whatever it is must contain 2 and 3 and that is answer choice E. 2 and 3. And that was number 132. Nothing to it, just change, turn it into quadratic equation and that's all there is. 133. Don't you sometimes wish that the data sufficiency problem would also go so nicely and so smoothly? Data sufficiency problem sometimes can be very nasty. Number 133 says, what is the approximate, and that's very important, we have to understand, we are looking for approximate value of root of 4.8 times 10 raised to 9, 10 raised to 9. Let me, so let's continue here. Let's write this as, let's write this as 4.8 times 10 raised to 3 times 10 raised to 6. Why? Because 10 raised to 6 is a million and the square root of a million is a thousand because thousand thousand makes a million. Oh and then I see 4.8 here. Let's break this thing further. Let's multiply by 10. Let's take 10 from here and put it here. Make it 48 times 10 is 10 squared. There we go. And now we're going to approximate. So far we have not done any approximation. Let's approximate that as this is 48, we're going to pretend that it is 49. 49 times 10 to the 2 times 10 raised to 6. And now it's very straightforward. Square root, square root of 49 is 7, the square root of 100 is 10, and the square root of a million is 1000. There you go. 1000 times 10 is 10,000, times 7 is 70,000. So the answer is the value of this thing, the value of this quantity, is approximately 70,000. It's approximately 70,000. Give me a second here, I'm going to get a new 
new eraser thing ready because the other one is falling apart. I'm not going to show you how I do it because it's pretty high tech and it's a secret recipe. There we go, now we have it. 133 was done. Let's look at number 134. One hundred and thirty-four. We are done with this thing. We don't. There is no need for us to keep it. It's actually a very, very simple problem. One hundred and thirty-four says that in a class, in a class, we are told that eighty percent take calculus. We are further told that sixty percent, sixty percent. Of those who are taking calculus also take physics. Sixty percent of these people, sixty percent of those people who are taking calculus are also taking physics. We are further told that 10% are taking neither. Question is, what percentage is taking physics? Now pay attention here, pay attention how the question is worded. The question is not what percentage is taking physics only. That is not what they are asking. They are asking what percentage is taking physics. That's all they said. Which means some of these people could very well be taking calculus as well. And 60% of those as a matter of fact because we are told here. As you can see it's a simple, di simple uh, Venn diagram. We need the room. Let's put it here. I'm going to raise this thing. So here is our calculus, here is our physics. Let's start slowly. 80% are taking calculus, so let's put an 80 here. And then we are told that 60% of those who are taking calculus are also taking physics. Also taking physics. We know 10% we know of 80 is 8. And therefore 60% is going to be 6 times the amount. 6 is the 40. Six uh, six sides of forty-eight, which means forty-eight people. Forty-eight people. Think of this as eighty people. Forget about the percentage for a second here. Just think of this as eighty people. Of those eighty people, of those eighty, forty-eight of those are also taking physics. So we have to take them away from here. There you go. Thirty-two people. Thirty-two people are taking calculus only. Forty-eight pe people are taking. Calculus and physics, and we are told 10% are taking neither. 10% are taking neither. All we have to do is add up the figures, which is very simple. It's 80 plus 10, if you like, because 80, this 80 includes this 48, or if you like, 32 plus 48, which is 80. 80 plus 10 is 90. That's only nine, or that's only 90%. That tells us that out of these 100 people, 10 people, 10 people must be taking physics only. We are not interested in physics only. The question is how many people are taking calculus, which is very straightforward. How many people are taking calculus? Well, we can see right here. Uh, calculus or physics? But what percentage is taking physics? What percentage is taking physics? Let me just double check on the book itself. Are taking physics? There you go. How many are taking physics? It's right here. 48 plus 10. 58 percent are taking physics. The answer is 58. We shouldn't say 58% are taking physics. That's, uh, yes, 58%, that's right. 58%. And vast majority of those 58 people, 58% are, who are taking physics, vast majority of them are also taking calculus. Almost all of them. We have to figure out what 48 is as a percentage of 58 to figure out what percent of this amount is taking taking both, just like we had here. But that was it.
135 is asking us the unit digit of 5610.37 divided by 10 raised to k we are told that the unit digit is 6. The question simply is if that is true if that is true that should be k not 7. I don't know where this 7 came from. 5610.37 10 raised to k we are told equals to is such that this quantity is such that the unit digit of this quantity is 6. And the question is, if that is true, what's the value of k? That's all it is. So as you can see, if we take this quantity 5610 divided by 5610.37 and divide by 10, that will give us 5,561.037, as we can clearly see. The unit digit here is 1. Unit digit is 1. We want unit digit to be 6 which means don't divide it by 10, divide it by 100. If you divide it by 100, it becomes, if you divide this quantity by 100, the unit digit, since it's second power, the unit digit can be transferred two places, and it becomes 56.1037. And now the unit digit of this quantity is 6. So that was the question. The question is, if you divide this quantity by 10 raised to some power, the unit digit is 6. What is that power? Well, we know now that power is 2. What's the value of k? The answer is k equals 2. k equals 2. Let's do the very last page, the very last one on the page, 136. It says R, S and T together take 4 hours to do a job. What, what job it is that they are doing really we don't care. We, 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 we are not concerned about it. So many a times in the problem they will tell you some elaborate job that they are doing. They are putting together this thing, they are doing that thing, they are no, just doing some job. What it is, we really don't care. <coughs> In this one, they're doing some printing job. What it is that they're printing, we really don't care. They're doing a job. We are further told that if S and T were to work together, just, just S and T, not R, not R, just S and T together, S and T together were to do the same job, it will take them five hours. And of course the question will go on to say at their respective constant pace and this with this and that. I'm not putting any of that on the blackboard, it's, it's understood. The question simply is how long how long will R take by himself? To do the job. How long will R take by himself or by herself, if you like, uh, uh, to do to do the job, to do, to do the entire job by himself or herself? Let's do it together, shall we? I need the room, so I'm going to actually erase this thing now. Now that we have it. So how how many people are dealing with here? No, we are not dealing with three people. We are not dealing with three people. As far as we are concerned, we have two people, R and this guy. These two guys treat that as one quantity because we are told as a one quantity. That's the key here. Don't deal with three different people, just deal with two people. Pretend that R plus R and S is just one, 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 one team. Do you understand? Let's begin. I'm going to read all of this thing. You already have the problem. Let's begin. So we know S 
and D take five hours. Which means that implies that implies that each hour, each hour they do one fifth of the job. Which makes perfect sense. If it's taking them five hours, and if you're told that they're working at constant pace, which they which they always are in these kind of problems, the pace is always assumed to be constant. Otherwise, you can't solve it. Uh, they must do one fifth of the job every hour. Which also implies, which also implies that in 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 four hours, in four hours, they do four fifths of the job. Why four hours? Because four hours is how long it takes them when the third guy joins in, which is why we're interested in four hours. So in four hours they do four fifths of the job. But when the third guy joins, when R joins, the job is done in four hours. They can finish the entire job in four hours as opposed to just four fifths. Which means this implies that R must do R must do the remaining the remaining one fifth of the job in four hours. Now we pick up the story from here. So now we know that R does R does one fifth of the job in four hours. Notice how I left the spaces in between. That was by design, that was on purpose. If R does if R does one fifth of the job in four hours, that must mean that R must do the entire job in 20 hours. That's all. That's all there is. That was the end of that page. Page number 82. Number 136. We're going to stop right here. We're going to meet again tomorrow and we'll pick up where we left off yesterday on the data sufficiency problems. Alright? If you wish to get hold of me, as I said before, send me an email kishwaniprep at icloud.com and I'll be happy to do what I can to help you get a better score. Okay? Bye now.